Welcome to my review for The House on Sorority Row, a slasher film which came out right in the middle of that golden generation of the subgenre. Well, it came out in 83, but it was filmed in the summer of 1981. I don't know why they took two years to release it, but yeah, it was made in that absolute brilliant epicenter of slasher movie filmmaking, which was 1981. It's directed by Mark Ronson, who bizarrely did not go on to make any other horror films after this one, I don't think. I, I, I watched this film the other night just to sort of make sure that it was fresh in my mind for the review, but I also watched the commentary track. And yeah, they were discussing with more than a trace of sadness about the fact that Ronson didn't go on to have a great career directing horror films. The plot for this is a little bit similar to I Know What You Did Last Summer, except whereas in that film, the gap between the bad deed and the comeuppance for the main characters is a whole year. In The House on Sorority Row, it's just a couple of hours. And for that reason, I think this film feels a bit more fluent in its storytelling. It's a bit tidier. It's not that I don't love. I know what you did last summer. That is something of a favourite film of mine as well. But I, I just think that this particular plot point was executed better with The House on Sorority Row. So to give you a little bit more in terms of synopsis, there are seven sorority girls living in the one house. It's coming to the end of term and they're going to throw a big sort of graduation party on the last day. But they don't get on very well with Mrs Slater, who's the middle aged woman who owns this sorority house. So a few hours before the party, they decide to play a prank on her, which involves holding her at gunpoint. It sounds completely silly when I'm relaying it to you right now. But when you're watching the movie, it doesn't seem so bad somehow. But of course, this prank goes wrong. Mrs Slater ends up getting accidentally shot and killed. And these girls are in an absolute panic now because they've got loads of people turning up for a party in a couple of hours. So they've got no time to get rid of the body properly. They basically kick it into the swimming pool and leave it there. And for the rest of the night, they try and forget all about what's happened, but they start to then get killed off one by one inside the party, outside the party, all around this building. And I don't think it's giving much away to tell you that Mrs Slater is not the killer because the movie sort of tries to hint that she might be the killer for some reason, but I, I think that would have been extremely unsatisfying if she had been. I mean, this woman clearly gets shot and falls in the swimming pool. So yeah, what superhuman feat it would have been if she'd have managed to have come back from that. But no, it turns out somebody else witnessed Slater getting killed, somebody with a very strong personal and emotional connection to this woman it's a he, he's a really creepy SOB, and he goes after all these girls for the rest of the movie. Now, I have a long association with this film. I watched it for the first time when I was a teenager. I saw it just a week after I'd seen Hell Night for the first time, another classic early 80s slasher. But when it first came on British TV, it was known as House of Evil. It's, it's one of those films which dicked around with its title a little bit. And because I thought that it was called House of Evil, I couldn't locate it for the longest time. There were times when I was in my 20s, I still remembered this great film I'd seen when I was a teenager. And I would be in like places like HMV and other DVD shops. And I think, oh, House of Evil, let's have a look in the horror section. Could never find it because I didn't know it had a different title. So finally, it was only when I got into my 30s and I was randomly... Messing around on my phone, I, I solved the mystery finally, but by this point, it'd been 20 years since I'd first watched it. But yeah, at that point, I went out and bought the Blu-ray, rediscovered it, and just enjoyed it all over again. The killer in this, whose name is Eric, he's expertly shot around. You get to see bits of him, like his hands, his eyes, the side of his face, but... Never enough that you could ever draw a full composite in your mind as to what he looks like. It's a bit similar to how the killer was filmed in Black Christmas, where you got to see the sides of his face and maybe one of his eyes, but not enough that you could ever pick the guy out in a police lineup. And actually, this is one area of filmmaking where John Carpenter's Halloween did not come, come top of the class, because there's a scene at the end of that film where... Myers' mask comes off and you get to see this guy who does not really look like the Myers we've pictured in our minds throughout the movie. It actually looks like an actor and not Michael Myers, but everything that Eric does in the house on Sorority Row is done with a real sense of style. He likes to leave children's toys out in the rooms where he's planning to kill somebody, you know, a softball here, a jack-in-the-box there. 
he puts on this really cool jester outfit in the final scene of the movie and all this is very representative of his childlike mentality and speaking of which there's a brilliant theme song in this film it's probably one of my favorite themes in any horror film it's not an easy one to remember it doesn't stick in your brain like the theme tune from Suspiria or The Exorcist in fact I, I watched this film the other night and even the following day I could not remember this tune I had to bring it up again on YouTube but there's two distinct versions of it in this the first one we get right at the start which is a really heavy kind of orchestral version that plays over the credits and then later on you get this more stripped back nursery rhyme version which perfectly encapsulates who Eric is. It, it's, it's the sort of tune which you could easily have given to somebody like Jason or the brothers from Hell Knight, you know, killers who shall we say did not really get a fair crack in life and as a result they've never been able to get past a certain level of maturity. Eric's kills are not the sort of works of art you see in something like The Prowler, but they're not soft kills either. I think Gorehounds will be really happy with the kills that are in this movie. And more importantly, they're staged well. They're given room to breathe. Characters are allowed to walk around for quite a bit before they die. You know, one character seems to take an age to try and locate a fuse box in a cellar. There's another character who gets to finish digging a grave and then walks slowly over to their van and then they're killed. And it doesn't hurt either that most of the kills are of characters who are very well established in the movie, thus giving them meaning. The main final girl in this, I hesitate to call her one of the best ever, but for me she probably is. If you'd have asked me at any point during my life to name some of my favourite final girls, I probably would have included this girl's name on whatever list I would have given you because she made a big impression on me as a teenager when I first watched this. I don't mean in a sexual way at all, just the character, the actress playing her, very impressive. In fact, I distinctly remember peering forward on my bed at the end of my first viewing to make sure I got the actress's name off the credits and I got it, Catherine McNeil. I don't think she went on to have an amazing career afterwards, but she did work, at least, according to the guys on the commentary track. She did a lot of TV work. Whatever she ended up doing, I never saw it. There's also a great performance in this by someone called Eileen Davidson, who plays the kind of slutty, bitchy character, I guess. But it's never overplayed. There's lots of restraint with the performance and how the, the, that character is written, to the point I could almost believe that this is actually not a bad person normally. She's just having a bad day. There's artistic restraint in this film. The other sorority girls are good as well. Some of them are written in more depth than others, but I feel sad with every single one of them when they die. There's a great moment about halfway through at the party scene where all seven girls are stood in different parts of the room and they all look really grim faced because they're worried that somebody's going to find the body in the pool. And the camera just zeroes in on one of them and then slowly moves to the next girl and then the next girl. And it feels like a really natural shot. It doesn't feel like something was staged. I could easily believe that the director came up with this shot on the night of filming. It, it's a really good one. And for my final positive today, I'm going to mention the chase at the end. It's not one of those flat out chases with lots of fighting and running like, say, Ginny and Jason at the end of Friday part two. This one's more of a cat and mouse slinking around in the shadows sort of job, but it's very effectively done. And the final scare where Eric dons the jester costume, it's absolutely phenomenal. It's a brilliant way to end the movie. Now for my negative section, I guess I've only got two negative things to say about this film and neither of them are that bothersome in all honesty. So firstly, there's a kill near the start of this film. Well, it's not near the start, but it is the first kill when it eventually does happen. But it's of a character who we've never seen before, before he dies. So I, I kind of feel like they could have taken this one out. There were plenty of other more important kills to come in the film. So yeah, just a little bit of an unnecessary one for me. And my second bad thing to say is that there's there's this really bad actress in this film. She plays one of the sorority girls called Morgan. There's something off about her acting early on in the film, but where it really comes to a head is in this one scene where 
the characters are all stood around a kitchen table deciding what to do about the body and this girl has to do this one line. I think she only gets this one line in the whole scene and she absolutely butchers it. It's one of the worst readings of a line I've ever heard in a movie. I, I think it's quite an infamous thing for people who have seen this film. A bit like the Garbage Day line delivery in that Silent Night, Deadly Night film. But if, if you go on YouTube and type in the house on Soriety Row, hilariously bad line reading or something like that. You're bound to find the video where you can easily watch this scene and find out what I'm talking about. It's atrociously bad. And I don't think this actress went on to do much after this film. And I, I'm not surprised about that at all. Now, I'll quickly show you the version of the film that I have for this. It's a very nice Blu-ray done by 88 Films. The quality of the transfer is not amazing given the fact that apparently it's supposed to have been remastered the first 10-15 minutes are a bit dubious there's quite a few scratches and stuff but i don't remember noticing much that's bad after that initial opening so i guess if you can just get through the first 10-15 it's really crisp after that point but the big bonus of this particular edition is the commentary track it's done by a group called the uh the hysteria continues or something like that i think they are specific to the 88 films uh, production team i think anyway but this track is really insightful i really enjoyed listening to it so let's get to the bag of terror then and give my score for this film we've arrived at that point lots of axes today so we've got one albeit the uh, the ends hanging off a little bit on that one two three four so we've got four and a half bloody axes i'm not really holding them in a great way but yeah there is four and a half out of five here this is one of my favorite standalone slasher films of all time it has to be said and it helps that i've got a personal connection to the film going back to when i was a teenager so there we have it i'll see if i can quickly fix this axe there we are Right, I'll be back another time with another slasher film review, hopefully. Until next time, cheerio, bye-bye.